typically involve not just a relationship between the subject and the proposition she has faith in, but also between the subject and some action. So faith seems to involve a disposition to act. A person who has faith that some claim is true should behave differently from the person who lacks faith that that claim is true. It seems like the person should be willing to act on the claim or take a risk on the claim. For example, if I have faith that my friend is trustworthy, I should be willing to tell her my secret. If I'm not willing to tell her my secret, that's an indication that I lack faith in her. So faith should make a difference in behavior. However, it seems like you could have faith that some claim is true relative to one act, but not relative to another. For example, let's say you know I'm the person with the old car. I don't know whether it will start. But I think, um, OK, I'm happy to rely on it to drive to work tomorrow. Then I have. Uh, faith that the car will start relative to the act of driving to work tomorrow. But I might, if somebody calls on me to use my car to drive, say, like a life-saving organ to the hospital, then I might say, eh, no, I don't, I don't have faith in my car relative to that act. Or similarly, I might have enough faith that God exists to attend church, but I might not have enough faith that God exists to martyr myself, for example. So it seems like Faith comes in degrees. And part of what um, implies or determines how much faith you have is what acts you're willing to do on the basis of that claim or which risks you're willing to take on the basis of that claim. So just with these preliminary observations, we can so far give an initial condition for what it takes to have faith. And it's here. A person has faith that X expressed by some act A, only if performing that act constitutes taking a risk on the claim X. Um, and we can uh, say more precisely what it is for an act to be a risk on some claim. Roughly, an act A is a risk on X. If there's some other act that we would be better if X weren't true, but A is better if X is true. So there's a, some alternative act B, such that X, if X holds, the person prefers A to B. And if X doesn't hold, he prefers B to A. So for example, um, I have faith that my friend Mary will keep my secret, expressed by the act of telling her my secret, um, be, because this act is a risk on X, uh, as follows, if I tell her my secret and it's true that she'll keep it, that's great, that's much better than, uh, so, sorry, so uh, if she'll keep my secret, it's better that I tell her than not. If she won't keep my secret, it's better that I not tell her than, I t than that I tell her. Similarly, uh, giving all my money to the poor constitutes taking a risk on the claim that God exists and demands that I give my money to the poor because if that's true, it's better that I give my money to the poor than not. But if that's false, it's better for me that I keep my money than that I give it to the poor. OK, so um, first idea, having faith requires taking a risk on the proposition or claim you have faith in. Okay. So the second important thing we want to talk about is that faith statements typically involve a relationship between the proposition the person has faith in and the evidence that the subject has for it. And this is going to end up being really important when we give different analyses. As we saw from one of the quotes, one uh, kind of maybe naive or initial idea of faith is that faith requires believing something you don't have evidence for. Um, so what are the different, uh, what's, what sort of evidence can you have in order to have faith in something? Well, the first thing to say is that if you have faith in something, it must be that the evidence alone doesn't yield certainty. So for example, it sounds weird to say, oh, I have faith that 2 plus 2 equals 4. Um, because you don't have faith. You're certain that 2 plus 2 equals 4. It sounds weird to say, oh, I have faith that there's water in this bottle. In fact, uh, right, because I'm certain that there's water in the, this bottle. In fact, when I say that, this calls to mind, oh, wait, do, do you mean you think there's some possibility that that's not water in this bottle? 
Um, so, you know, these facts imply that uh, you can't have faith in something if you're certain of it. It's just not a candidate in, for faith if your evidence alone yields certainty. But beyond that, it seems like there aren't a lot of restrictions on what evidence you can have for a proposition and for it to still be a candidate for faith. So, for example, you might have no evidence at all for the proposition and still count as having faith. So, uh, here's a statement that sounds apt. You might say, I have no idea whether God exists, but I have faith that God exists. That's, you know, maybe that's rational or not. We haven't gotten to that yet. But that doesn't seem like not a case of faith in the same way that saying, I have faith that you'll continue to smoke is just not a case of faith. You might even have evidence against the proposition and still have faith. So here's another statement that sounds apt. You spill my secret every single time I've told you a secret, but I have faith that you'll keep this one. <laughs> That's, um, while maybe we laugh because you think like, ah, bad idea, don't have faith there, uh, that seems to be a possible case of faith. It's not false to say that the person has faith. We just think maybe they have misplaced faith. However, you might also uh, have faith if you have some evidence in favor of the proposition. So here's another statement that sounds apt. You've done well on all the tests in the past. I have faith that you'll do well on this one too. That sounds fine. What I'm saying is I have a lot of evidence for the statement in question. And furthermore, I have faith. So the only restriction on uh, how much evidence you can have for a statement in order for it to be a, not to be a candidate for faith is that a proposition is not a candidate for faith if you're certain of it. But it can be a candidate for faith if you either have no evidence, if you have evidence against it, or if you have evidence for it. OK. So what about the phenomenology of faith? What does faith feel like? Well, faith feels like a risk. Seems like faith involves a commitment of some sort. Um, so maybe we can explain the fact that it feels like a risk by the fact that uh, having faith that X requires you to be willing to do an act that's a risk on A. What about the functional role or the role that faith plays in practices? Well, one thing that's often said of faith is that um, the person who has faith doesn't consider counter evidence, or maybe uh, sort of more precisely, that faith is in some sense steadfast in the face of counter evidence. Uh, faith doesn't disappear at the first sign of um, some evidence against the proposition. It seems like one role that faith plays is that we make commitments on the basis of our faith. So if I have faith in a person, say I have faith that my uh, friend will pick me up at the airport, well, then I uh, make a commitment to taking a risk on that because I don't like call a cab to wait for me there just in case she doesn't show up. Um, this is a sort of question. It seems like faith is usually voluntary. That's why faith is um, said, said to be a virtue. So we typically think that things are only uh, virtues or, or things are only uh, things that you ought to do or ought not to do if it's up to you whether or not you do them. So it seems like maybe there's some voluntary aspect to faith. Um, and finally, of course, it coheres with religious and friendship ethics. So when we give whatever our final account of faith is, we don't want it um, having faith to result in your doing something that your friends wouldn't want you to do or for you to do something that uh, religions that endorse having faith wouldn't want you to do, right? It would be really bad if it turned out that um, uh, having faith went against some other Christian principle because um, having faith is something that's lauded and considered a virtue by Christianity. All right, so um, that's the data and the preliminary account that faith involves performing an action or being willing to perform an action that's a risk on the act. What I want to do now is go through a couple different analyses of how this um, relationship between the person and what they believe and the evidence goes. And I'm going to showcase three different analyses 
and argue for why I think they're wrong on the basis of the data that we have about faith, then I'm going to give what I think is the correct account of faith, though of course, you know, again, uh, you should be keeping in mind whether you agree with me and think about how you might argue against this. And then finally, I'm going to show if my account of faith is correct, then we can actually say under what circumstances having faith is rational and under what circumstances having faith isn't rational. Um, and it turns out, happily on my account, that there are cases of faith where having faith is rational. Okay, so here's the first proposal, and this is um, along the lines of the second quote. Uh, to have faith is to have a belief that outruns the evidence. So this account says that faith requires believing what you know to be false, or maybe slightly more weakly, believing more strongly than you think the evidence warrants, or maybe even slightly more weakly, um, faith requires being certain when you don't have enough evidence to be certain. I guess that's, that last thing is not weaker than the second thing. But the, the idea is evidence says, you know, believe to this degree. Faith says bump it up a little bit. Maybe bump it up all the way to certainty. So for example, here's how this would play out. Let's say I have faith that my friend will keep a secret, but a third party comes to me and says, gosh, your friend's a gossip. She is terrible at keeping secrets. On this view, in order to have faith, I have to consider this to be evidence against my friend's trustworthiness, but just ignore it. So I say, look, um, I believe that my friend is trustworthy. Gosh, I have this evidence against it. I think that's good evidence. So on the basis of the evidence alone, I should believe that my friend's not trustworthy. But because I have faith in my friend, I'll just ignore that, and I'll believe she's trustworthy anyway. So this does explain some of the data, which is, um, I suspect, why some people have been drawn to this account. One data it explains is the idea that faith feels like a commitment. In this case, it's a commitment to a belief. It's a commitment to a belief regardless of what the evidence says. And it also explains the sense in which an individual doesn't consider counter evidence. They don't consider counter evidence because um, they take the evidence, including the counter evidence, and they just say, look, that's what the evidence suggests, but I'm going to bump my belief up above that. Um, okay, so, you know, there's something to be said for this account, but I do have a couple objections to it. The first is that it seems like belief isn't totally under your control, but in order for this account to be correct, it would have to be. So here's an example to show that belief isn't totally under your control. OK, everybody, believe that the lights in this room are off. Go ahead. Believe that. You just can't do it, right? Even if you wanted to, even if I said, OK, hey, I'll pay you $100 if you believe the lights in this room are off. Go ahead. <laughs> <Just Nobody>. <laughs> <laughs> you, you did it. And, and nobody touched the light switch, by the way. <laughs> um, even so, and even maybe more weekly, um, so maybe that's a case of like believing something you know to be false. And here we're talking about being more certain than the evidence warrants. Um, here's another example. Okay, I guess we don't know who will win the Super Bowl. Maybe we have some evidence that Denver will win. Okay, be certain that Denver will win the Super Bowl. Go ahead. No, You're nodding. <laughs> um, so um, even in that case, it seems like you, even if you had some evidence, you couldn't just decide to get yourself all the way to certainty. So this account asks you to do something that it seems like isn't even possible for people to do. Um, so relatedly, if this is what faith would like, if this is what faith is like, then the phenomenology of faith, what faith feels like, would involve a lot of psychological tricks and deception, right? The only way you can kind of like get yourself into the mindset of believing something more strongly than the evidence suggests is to like try to trick yourself. So if this is the right account, that's what faith would feel like. But it doesn't seem to feel that way. Furthermore, if faith is supposed to be a virtue according to religious ethics and the ethics of friendship, then that would imply that religious ethics and the ethics of friendship think it's a virtue to try to psychologically deceive yourself into thinking, 
um, believing something more strongly than you think the evidence warrants. But it seems like this, in fact, conflicts with the ethics of friendship and the ethics um, that most religions teach. Um, finally, there's a puzzle of why this would be considered a virtue. If faith is supposed to be a virtue in religious contexts and in interpersonal contexts, it's just hard to see um, what positive role doing this would play. OK, so you might think, well, there's sort of still something right about this analysis. Let me try it again. So yeah, you're right. It's impossible to believe more strongly than the evidence suggests. But maybe what faith asks us to do isn't believe more strongly than the evidence suggests, but just act more certain than we feel, or act more certain than we think the evidence warrants. So here's the second analysis. It says, to have faith is to act in a way that outruns the evidence. So faith requires taking more of a risk than the evidence warrants, or even acting as if you are certain when you don't really have enough evidence to be certain. So for example, let's say you have faith that your friend will keep a secret, and a third party comes to you and says, ah, your friend's a gossip, don't trust her. On this view, you do consider this to be evidence against your friend's trustworthiness, and you do stop believing that she's trustworthy. You go, OK, well, yeah, gosh, I don't know whether she's trustworthy or not. Nonetheless, you continue to act as if she is trustworthy. So for example, you would continue to share your secrets with her, even though you think, yeah, like, I don't know, the evidence says she's probably not that trustworthy. So this, again, explains some things. It explains the fact that faith feels like a commitment. In this case, it would be commitment to an act rather than commitment uh, to a belief. And it also explains why it's robust in the case of counter evidence. And it also explains the fact that um, maybe in certain sometimes faith it goes against doubt. So you sort of have doubt that the thing is true, but you think, like, nonetheless, I need to have faith. However, um, there are some objections to this account as well. Um, so first of all, it seems unclear. So on this account, you would have to make decisions that are unjustified by the evidence. And again, it seems like religious ethics and the ethics of friendship don't really endorse doing that. So your friend wouldn't say to you, like, look, I know you have no good evidence at all um, that I'm, uh, I don't know, a good skier. Nonetheless, uh, why don't you take me up to the top of this mountain and on this really hard hill, and we'll hold hands and go down the slope together. Um, <laughs> that's not something that it seems like a friend ought to ask of you or would ask, for, ask of you. Um, similarly, in a religious context, there is uh, the idea of conscience and following your conscience. This says, um, you know, go with some, go with, take a risk more than you think is warranted by the evidence. So in some sense, go against your conscience. <laughs> Furthermore, it seems like maybe this account endorses not being completely honest about what you believe. So if someone says, so let's say on this account, you have faith that your friend will keep a secret, um, and somebody comes up to you and says, oh, uh, so uh, your friend, is she trustworthy? And you know the evidence. You say, oh, like, you don't believe she is. But according to this account, you're supposed to act as if you believe she is. So you're sub you should say, oh, yes, I fully believe she's trustworthy. So it seems like you're not lying or, or being totally accurate about what you believe. And again, it's unclear that the ethics of friendship or the ethics of religion would endorse this. OK, so here's another position. So so far, we've been looking at positions that, that take it that the evidence is fixed, and then you approach it, and you somehow have to apply faith once the evidence is already kind of determined what you should believe on, it, on its basis. But you might think, actually, the picture of our mental life is different. What happens in our, our mental life is when we approach a body of evidence, there are often lots of different ways to interpret this body of evidence. And we have to pick one. So maybe faith fits in there. So maybe to have faith, faith determines which way you go in one of these decisions where you're not sure how the evidence will turn out. 
So this is the third analysis tries to build off that idea. And the third analysis says, well, to have faith is to adopt a belief before you examine the evidence. So faith requires adopting a belief and then examining the evidence in light of that belief. So for example, on this account, let's say I have faith that my friend will keep a secret and a third party again comes to me and says, she's a gossip. On this view, I don't even consider this to be evidence against my friend's trustworthiness because I assume the person must be lying or mistaken. So I just come in with this belief that I have on the basis of, the, of my faith that my friend can't possibly be untrustworthy. I just, I, I believe that she's going to keep my secret and I'm gonna look at all evidence in light of that belief. So when somebody comes up to me and says, no, she's not gonna keep your secret, well, given that I have this entrenched belief that she will, I must conclude that this person is lying or mistaken or wrong or just hasn't looked at the evidence correctly. So this is the idea that faith informs how you look at a body of evidence. Um, now there's some advantages to this account too. One advantage is that there really does seem to be this feature of mental life, that we have to decide uh, which way we're going to go when we look at a body of evidence. But it seems like uh, there are some objections here as well. First of all, according to religious ethics, we should be humble and teachable, particularly in religious matters. But this says we'll just start with a belief and allow that no evidence could ever tell against that belief. That doesn't seem like something religious ethics would endorse. Similarly, on this account, you actually, once you apply your faith, or you sort of apply your faith and then look at the evidence, so it looks to you as if you're, you're going to be certain of the thing in question because you sort of start out assuming that thing is true. But if you're certain, then you're not taking a risk when you do the act. So it's unclear how the idea that faith is a risk or involves taking a risk fits in here. Maybe it can involve, maybe it means like taking a risk in what you believe or something like that, but it seems like when you take a risk on the basis of faith, you do so fully with the idea that you could be wrong. That's partly what makes it a risk or a leap of faith. Um, finally, I think, the strongest objection against this view is that there are actually two different phenomena here. One is credulity and one is faith. So this account confuses credulity with faith. So you could be a really skeptical person. You could say, look, I'm not going to believe something unless I have a lot of evidence. And you could still end up having faith. That seems to be what happened in the case of St. Paul. He's described as being skeptical, but then developed faith. Um, similarly, it seems like we could have a person that's very credulous, that just assumes things are true before looking at the evidence, and still doesn't have faith. It seems like these are just two different concepts. <coughs> okay, so a final objection to all three of these accounts is that it seems like we can actually distinguish between cases of well-placed faith and cases of misplaced faith. For example, um, I gave some examples earlier where, oh, my friend has lied to me hundreds of times, but I think she's telling the truth this time. I have faith that she's telling the truth this time. Or uh, my friend has always told the truth, and I have faith that she will continue to tell the truth. These are two cases of faith. They both count as faith. But in this case, we think the faith is misplaced. And in this case, we think the faith is um, aptly placed. It's correctly placed faith. But none of these three accounts give us a way to distinguish between these two cases. Now you might think, well, we can just distinguish between them on the basis of whether the thing is true or not. So you might say a well-placed faith is faith in something that turns out to be true, and misplaced faith is faith in something that turns out to be false. But notice in these examples, I didn't actually tell you whether the friend was trustworthy or not. And you could already see just from the description of her past behavior that this was a case of misplaced faith and this was a case of well-placed faith. So the difference between the cases can't be whether she's actually telling the truth or not. It has to be something about 
your position relative to the friend or relative to the evidence and so forth. And none of these three accounts can explain that. Okay. So here's my proposal. So start with the idea that um, there are several uh, different types of behavior that would make us think you don't have faith. So for example, let's say you have faith that your spouse isn't cheating on you. This seems to rule out hiring a private investigator, seems to rule out looking at your spouse's mail, seems, a, seems to rule out like striking up a conversation with her boss, like just to figure out where she was last night, and so forth. If you have faith that your friend will keep a secret, and you're deciding whether to tell, tell your secret, it seems like you can't first ask some other person, like, ah, do you think this friend will keep my secret or not? It seems like that would indicate a lack of faith in your friend. So um, here's my proposed analysis. To have faith is to be willing to act without considering further evidence. So I think that faith in a proposition requires stopping your search for additional evidence about the truth of that proposition and committing to a risky act on the basis of that proposition. So you have to consider your search for evidence to be closed and just take a risk as if you know that proposition is true. Having faith requires not engaging in an inquiry whose only purpose is to figure out the truth of the claim one purportedly has faith in. And we might add, faith requires adopting a commitment to continue with the act even if counter evidence comes in. So, you know, we have these couple secular examples. We might even try to explain certain cases of religious faith in these terms. So, doubting Thomas, who like needs to see more evidence before he believes that it's Jesus. Um, this idea that a faithless generation demands a sign. The idea of um, asking for signs or further confirmation as being a sign uh, that you lack faith. Um, so that's my proposed analysis. I do want to add one caveat because here's the kind of person we think of as a paradigm example of a faithful person. A person who goes to seminary to study um, all the things that are true about God, maybe even to read arguments for and against God's existence, to figure out what people have thought about God in the past, maybe to even look at the historical evidence for, say, the claim that Jesus rose from the dead, so that he can share that information with other people. We wouldn't want to count our seminarian as not a case of faith, right? That's a good case of faith. So I think the caveat we should add is that it's OK if you look for more evidence um, for other purposes, as long as you're not looking for evidence for the purpose of figuring out whether the claim you're taking a risk on is true. So the test is whether you would make commitments on the basis of the claim without first seeing that, ev that evidence. So if someone says, I'm going to go to seminary and like research all this evidence for um, the, you know, whether Jesus was indeed resurrected. Um, but he says, yeah, but like I'm not going to go to church until I figure that out. I'm just going to like remain agnostic until then. Then we think of that person as not having faith. Um, but actually when we, we look about, at it, the seminarian is an example of faith on this account because he's taking, going to seminary is a risk on the claim that God exists. If God exists, going to seminary is a really good thing. If God doesn't exist, um, there are probably alternatives that would be better than going to seminary. So he's taking this risk and he's not waiting on more evidence in order to take that risk. So he's allowed to gather evidence as long as it's not for the purpose of figuring out um, whether or not he should make a commitment on the basis of the religi religious claim. Okay. So here's the final account. A subject X, or a subject A has faith that X expressed by an act A only if two conditions hold. Performing the act constitutes taking a risk on the claim and the subject chooses to commit to the act before he examines additional evidence rather than to postpone his decision about the act until he examines additional evidence. So in short, 
To have faith is to stop one's search for evidence about a particular proposition and commit to taking a risk on that proposition. Okay. So that's the account of faith. Uh, again, I invite you to think about whether you think this account captures the central cases of faith or whether you think it's missing something. Um, but let's just take this account on board right now. If this account is right, what does this say about faith and rationality? So luckily, we can say something concrete about when acting without further evidence is good and when instead you ought to at first gather more evidence. So in short, if my analysis of faith is correct, we can say precisely when it is rational to have faith in something. So um, there's a formal result here. I'm not going to go through it, but I'm just going to tell you the basic idea is that um, we use the tools of decision theory, which is a theory, a mathematical theory of, about um, when an act is going to do better for you than another act in situations of risk. And one such act is gathering some evidence before making a decision. So we can say, OK, under what circumstances is committing to an act ranked higher than first looking for more evidence and then either committing or not committing to the act, depending on how the evidence turns out. So here are the conditions under which, in fact, it's rational to stop your search for evidence and commit to an act. First, you're taking a risk on the proposition. That's just the condition for your like exercising your faith in the first place. Um, and then the following three conditions also obtain. And here's the rough reason that these are the conditions under which not looking for evidence is a good thing. Think about the process of looking for more evidence and then making a decision. This could have some upsides and it could also have some downsides. Here's the major upside. The evidence could tell you that the thing you thought was true was false. So for example, um, let's say your friend really is a gossip and she's going to spill your secret. Then asking the third party might give you evidence that she's a gossip and you won't tell her your secret. So you end up better off because you've looked for the evidence and you've not done the act you thought you would do. Okay. So that's an upside of looking for more evidence. It can stop you from taking bad risks. But there are also some downsides in looking for more evidence. One downside is that it can keep you from doing an act that would have turned out well. This can be the case if you get misleading evidence. So let's say the third party says your friend is a gossip, but in fact she's not. She's perfectly trustworthy, and, uh, but hearing this from the third party makes you not tell her your secret. So therefore you've missed out on some good you could have had, the good of telling the secret to the friend that's in fact trustworthy instead of not telling her the secret. Another downside of looking for more evidence is sometimes there are costs to postponing making a decision about something. So in this friend case, maybe your friend is only available to tell the secret to tonight, otherwise you'll have to wait a while and it'll just sort of like burn on your mind until you do. So, but if you wanna look for evidence first, you have to postpone telling the decision. Um, you have to postpone telling her the secret. Or let's say the person deciding whether or not to enter seminary, he wants to first gather more evidence about whether or not God exists. Well, then he's going to have to wait a year um, to apply again or maybe another year. Um, eventually, he's just not going to get started on his seminary career at all. So there are costs to postponing a decision before you look for more evidence. So that's like an upside of looking for more evidence and some downsides. And these are the conditions, rough conditions, under which the downsides are gonna outweigh the upsides. So uh, first of all, you already have a lot of evidence and on its basis are pretty confident that X. Second, the evidence you are considering gathering is such that if it tells against X, it won't be conclusive. So this is the idea that if you get evidence against X, you're like pretty equally likely to be in the good situation where the evidence is stopping you from doing something harmful as you are to be in the bad situation where the evidence is stopping you from doing something good. So let's say this third party 
isn't really very reliable. And she says to you, your friend is not good at keeping secrets. Now you've put yourself in a situation in which, well, you don't, you're not sure enough about the friend to tell her your secret, but there's actually a pretty good chance that this evidence was misleading and that your friend is actually a really good um, secret keeper. Finally, uh, if the following condition is met, postponing the act would be costly or you're risk averse in the sense that um, when, that, that the, how things go in the worst case scenario weight more heavily for you than how things go in the best case scenario. Okay, so those are the conditions under which you shouldn't look for more evidence, you should just act, or if my account is correct, those are the conditions under which it's rational to have faith. More loosely, um, these conditions will obtain when you have a lot of evidence for the proposition in question and your evidential situation is such that any additional piece of evidence you could gather won't be conclusive. So faith will be rational if those two uh, conditions obtain, you have a lot of evidence, and uh, counter evidence won't be conclusive. So we can see maybe why faith would be more likely to be rational in cases like religious cases or interpersonal cases where the evidence out there in the world might be sparse. There's not going to be like much conclusive evidence against your friend's trustworthiness. If you already have a lot of evidence that she's trustworthy, um, looking for more evidence can very often just lead you into a muddle where you're like sort of not sure and that will harm you in being able to get what you want out of the relationship, namely sharing her, your secret with her. But maybe um, faith won't be rational in other contexts, so maybe in scientific contexts it's much less likely for faith to be rational. Uh, postponing um, scientific discoveries isn't always costly. Furthermore, Often there's just a lot of evidence about scientific theories, so evidence in that domain is just more apt to be conclusive. So we can see how we can delineate situations in which faith is rational from those in which faith isn't rational. If you already have a lot of evidence for something and there's no more conclusive evidence out there to be found, then having faith is rational. You ought to have faith and you stand to miss out on something if you don't. Additionally, there's another type of situation in which having faith in this sense is rational, and that's an interpersonal context. So think about the situation in which um, you and I are, uh, we both have weapons, but we want, we prefer to both disarm. So um, let's say, what happens if we decide, okay, I'm, we both decide, okay, I'm just going to believe the other person um, is going to disarm, and I'm going to act on that belief, and I'm going to disarm myself. I don't need more evidence. Okay, then you disarm, that's good. But if you look for more evidence, and the other person does too, you have to worry not only about the possibility that they were lying about disarming, but you have to worry about the possibility that when they look for evidence, they accidentally come across misleading evidence that you're not going to disarm. You also have to worry about that they come across misleading evidence that you've come across misleading evidence that they're going to disarm. And you have to worry that they come across evidence <coughs> that you, or that they come across evidence that you've come across evidence that they've come across evidence that you'll disarm, and so <laughs> forth. So if we just agree, if we already have evidence about each other's trustworthiness, and we both agree not to look for more evidence, we both do better, even if the only thing we have at stake is our own, um, is our own survival. Okay. So just a couple key takeaway points from this talk. Uh, if you remember nothing else, first, faith is a distinct attitude from belief. It involves taking a risk without looking for more evidence. Second, faith can be rational and faith can be irrational. Its rationality depends on how much evidence you already have and on the character of the available evidence. Finally, Individuals who lack faith, because they insist on gathering all of the available evidence before taking a risk, stand to miss out on great opportunities. And this is why faith is a virtue and also why faith is an important attitude in human life. All right, thanks for listening.